Good morning, everyone. It's about 10 to 7 my time, um, so bear with me here. Um, I'm Bro Zangler with Care Oregon. And uh, thank you to Jay Powell, Quentin, Jason, the whole team. You guys have been fantastic to work with so far. We're really excited about this opportunity. So Care Oregon, we're a 501c3 health services organization. We have the largest Medicaid risk pool in Oregon and the largest dual special needs Medicare plan. So a DSNIP plan is specific to folks who are low income and disabled, so very fragile individuals. The majority of our um, Medicare folks are duly eligible for Medicaid as well. And we've got about 230,000 lives that we cover, which yes, in Oregon is the largest <laughs> plan. We're not a very, we're a big state, but we only have about 3.5 million people total. Um, the uh, Care Oregon has been working on some social determinants of health interventions for years. Um, through community health and doing work with folks coming out of hospitals, putting them in hotels, uh, citing master social workers in clinics where we have some of our highest need patients to work individually with folks, and uh, have been making very concerted efforts around social determinants in the past three to five years. I was asked to lead the social determinants team, which we have now 10 FTE and four AmeriCorps VISTAs working on social determinants at Care Oregon. And our focus is our housing, uh, food, nutrition, social supports, and transportation. We also dabble in some culturally and linguistically appropriate care for folks. Um, so our, our challenges is really identifying the role of a health plan in clinical and social determinant interventions. I think that what we've found, particularly on a health plan side, is that a lot of what we call social determinants tends to be a little too upstream for what our board and what our finance department um, finds to be a reasonable timeline. I think you know Quentin mentioned earlier that sometimes it's hard to disentangle that data. It's hard to see the, the major dents that we're making, particularly when we're dealing with folks in poverty, and that is the definition of the people that we serve. So what we're realizing is that we really need to promote a systemic alignment between social service and healthcare entities and reduce those barriers to achieve the clinical outcomes. So again, there's sort of general health and well-being, and then there's very discrete clinical outcomes that we think can be um, arrived through uh, or achieved through social determinant interventions. So again, we're, we're working on a triple aim of a defined population. So we're looking very high risk, high utilizing individuals. Um, we're, we're partnering with the community to look at the broader social determinants work, but our work on the Care Oregon Social Determinants team really is this defined population. And we're trying to take um, the idea of population health out of just population medicine, which is what I think most of us really talk about when we talk about population health. Um, and looking at, at the whole health of individuals, particularly high utilizers. So again, you know, sort of the way we're looking at this, the, the vast majority of folks really just need a light touch. They need to be able to be navigated or partnered with community organizations that are already doing amazing housing, food, transportation work. So various programs are out there. I think that we as healthcare providers often come in and say, oh, we're healthcare, we've got this. And then there's all these housing agencies saying, we've, we've known for years, guys, we've, we actually have this. So, you know, healthcare sort of barging into this space saying, social determinants of health, and housers are saying, no housing, it's, we know. Um, so, trying to, you know, make use of those, the experts in the field in these, these areas already, when that doesn't meet the needs of our members, then we can come in and support additional capacity within our partners and pay for some of those services with healthcare dollars. And then the last place we should look is to design those specific interventions. So, you know, it's also being stewards of the healthcare money and identifying where we can um, really work. So what we in Care Oregon are doing is creating what really looks analog to like a PPO for community services, um, our, our provider network. So we can have preferred partners with contractual relationships where we have data loops that if we send a referral or we are even somehow navigate over HIPAA and fair housing and all these other privacy acts to, to specifically place individuals, so it's more of a ref it's less of a referral and more of a warm or a hot handoff, um, then those folks can come back to us and say, hey, this is how many doses 
of food or how many months of housing as a dose people are getting, and then we can put those up against our clinical data. Um, again, you know, we're targeting acute medical conditions, and this is one of the interesting things about Oregon, that we have a flex funding on, under our 1115 Medicaid waiver, which means that we can actually spend our Medicaid rates on things that are not CPT or ICT, ICD-10 code. So we can use our Medicaid dollars for health-related, but not health care. So we think of, of health care, you know, it's doctors and shots and medicine and hospitals. So now we're able to use part of our Medicaid rates on things like housing or food interventions. Now, mind you, we do not get more money for this. We have to use our existing resources. But if we can figure out a way to make that ROI work out, it ends up being a great opportunity. Um, our, our plans, our programs around housing, we do have on-site programs where we site healthcare folks for older adults um, or people who are unstably housed. We have recuperative and respite housing for people coming out of the hospital that don't have stable housing, so we're not um, discharging people onto the street. Uh, we're working with, uh, we have two housing case managers that are specifically able to navigate health systems to help homeless members find housing, and we're working on trying to get connected with our coordinated entry system through HUD. Uh, for food, we do uh, palliative and curative nutrition. We'll talk about a case study here in a second. Um, and with our social inter interactions, we've got one-to-one -one peer support, uh, sort of a volunteer peer core. We partner with senior companions through CNCS and make sure that our members have access to that, that they're able to be both uh, providers of the, of the peer support program, which gives them some income, and also working with our members on becoming clients of the Senior Companions Program and creating care plans for them. Um, we also do use peer supports as a mental health, sort of a group support, um, but we don't call it mental health because nobody likes to talk about mental health. But you know, if you just wanna come and hang out at a coffee hour, then that makes it where people feel much more welcome to come in and we do those in low-income housing buildings where we know we have lots of members. Um, for transportation, we have non-emergency medical transportation, which is a mandated benefit in Oregon, um, but we also are working on trying to figure out other ways of offering transportation, picking up a prescription or going to the grocery store, so things that are going to affect our member health. So let's look through um, a little bit of food programs here. So uh, this is Mary, my pal in the wheelchair here. Mary's coming out of the hospital. Now, um, Mary's lucky because she has folks with her, but... Uh, if Mary meets the criteria for Meals on Wheels and we find out that she's food insecure, either through our transitions team going into the hospital and doing a screening or through social workers in the hospital saying that she's food insecure, if she's over 65, homebound, et cetera, we now have an agreement with Meals on Wheels that Mary doesn't have to call. Our staff can call and say we would like Mary to be signed up for Meals on Wheels and she can get that indefinitely. If, however, Mary is, uh, meets some, is, is not Meals on Wheels eligible, We've worked out a case rate with Meals on Wheels where we can also call and sign her, sign her up and say that we're worried about her having some food insecurity issues. When we say clinical insecurity criteria, it sounds a lot more uh, definite than, than it is. Really, if we have a clinician that comes to us and says, I am concerned about this person's health, that if they don't have appropriate nutrition, then it could exacerbate an existing condition, particularly you know, malnutrition, um, we then have a case rate with Meals on Wheels that we can order a four week or more, but right now we're doing four weeks of meal delivery post-discharge. And then as we get more down to that bottom of the triangle, then we can say if Mary has a wound that won't heal, we have a specific protocol of eight weeks of healthy food with protein supplements that are specifically tailored to her weight and the size of her wound, and we can deliver that directly to her home, assuming she has a home. If she does not, we can always work with her to find local resources um, or drop-in centers or soup kitchens to make sure that she has appropriate food. So let's look at a case study on the food just to give you guys an idea of the kinds of things we're talking about when we say clinical interventions with social determinants. So this is a case study of an individual that came through our wound care program. Um, his wound was diagnosed on January 10th of 2014. He had 153 wound care clinic visits. These are specific visits to a wound care site. He was very compliant. Um, he always took his medication. He always showed up. And yet, he still has a wound after. 
after 153 visits. He also had 13 inpatient days and two ED visits specifically related to this wound. So we've stripped out everything that's not related to his wound specifically right here. So he has lots of other visits. So all told, we had over $114,000 in claims for this gentleman's wound care. And you know, as you can see, he also suffered for a long time. I mean, from the time that he went to the time that he was discharged was over a year. Um, we gave him his food and protein delivery that we just talked about and spent $1,050 on food for this gentleman, which some people are like, oh, God, $1,000 in food. But after he was discharged in July, he's had no additional wound care visits. So this is the kind of outcomes that we're looking for and, and hoping to provide. Um, my time is up, so we can chat a little bit about the evaluation of, it, of impact. We're a little concerned about ACA funding because most of our programs are coming from that. Um, you know, we have a number of proposed outcomes around hospital utilization and increased quality metrics and, providers, and member and provider satisfaction. That's important. It's a big part of the triple aim that we often forget. We always get excited about the cost and the, and the care, but your experience of care, both on the provider and client side, is important. And uh, we are using our internal data, but it's challenging to randomize with things like this. It's challenging to, uh, to scope what that very specific protocol is because what food looks like for somebody may look different for another person. So we're excited to work with j on that. Thank you.